Uh, so I'm joined today by uh, Nate Geraci, who is the president of uh, the ETF store and the host of a ETF Prime podcast. Uh, good to see you today. Nate, how are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. A pleasure to see you as well. Nate, you actually recently uh, wrote a blog on um, a number of questions that you're pondering about ETFs, um, especially during this time of uh, the pandemic. One that you argued is that um, if a sell-off in the industry happens, and I think we've already seen that, will it spur new money into ETFs? Um, can you speak about this? Yeah, you know, I find it interesting because if you look back to 2008 and the financial crisis, and then more recently in 2018, when we saw the S&P 500 down about 20% into the fourth quarter, in both of those instances, we've seen an acceleration of flows into ETFs and really out of actively managed mutual funds. And I think there are two primary reasons for that. I think number one, on the active mutual fund side, I think some investors believe that active management might save them from a substantial downturn. And whether we look at 2008 or 2018, and I think even here more recently with, with this coronavirus situation, that's just not the case. There may certainly be some active managers who generate outperformance, but your ability to determine who those managers are before the, the downturn is, is limited. And when you look at the aggregate data overall, the outperformance just isn't there. And so I think what happens is coming out of these downturns, investors go, you know what? I've been paying these more uh, substantial fees for active management. What am I getting in return? And they realize that maybe the value proposition isn't there. And so I think a natural um, evolution from there is to look at ETFs because they are lower cost. They tend to be index based. And so you know, I think it'll be interesting to see after we saw the 34% decline uh, from February into March, if we do see that uptick in ETF flows. And if you look here more recently in April, we have started seeing that. There were $50 billion in, uh, in, in new investor dollars that went into ETFs in April. I think one other interesting point there is, let's just say you are an investor and uh, you're, in, you're in active mutual funds. You may have been locked into those mutual funds because you had big enough gains that if these were held in taxable accounts, you couldn't sell them because you would take a tax hit. And so with the market being down, nobody wants to see that, but it does sort of unlock that the padlock on the mutual funds that was due to the capital gains and allow you to move into other vehicles. I think one of which is ETF. And you mentioned fees briefly then. Um, do you th so you, you think that the, um, the story of ETF fees is not over. You think there's more to it? Yeah, you know, it's so interesting because I've been one uh, who in the past have said that the ETF fee war is coming to an end or over, and I, I keep being wrong on that. And interestingly here over the past couple of months, I mean, we've seen Vanguard cutting fees on some ETFs. We've seen Schwab cutting fees. We've seen uh, iShares. And then here over the past month, BNY Mellon, who's a new entrant into the ETF space, they launched the first truly zero fee stock and bond ETF. So there's no fee waivers, no restrictions on these. And so I think there is going to continue to be this, this simmering fee war. And I think just when we think it's going away, uh, it manifests itself again. And if ever there was a, an example of that, it was here recently where everybody's focused on a global pandemic. We, we clearly have the economy not in a great situation. And yet you still have these large asset managers cutting fees in a time where, you know, maybe the outlook moving forward doesn't look so great, even for their own businesses, they're still cutting fees. I think that says a lot. And uh, I don't think that the, the fee war is over. I, I will say, I do think to a certain degree, the conversation is shifting more to value proposition. What are you getting for what you're, you're paying for? I think that's a good uh, pivot. I think that's a healthy conversation to have. I think we need to have more of it, but I think fees are always going to be front and center. Some really good points there on fees. And um, moving towards something a bit different, um, you also mentioned in your in your recent blog that the pandemic and the ongoing fallout from it um, potentially point towards uh, there being more investment in um, ESG ETS. Um, do you think that's the case? I, I do. You know, personally, I've been very skeptical of the ESG space. And the reason for that is I just believe that the market sort of incorporates all different risk factors and opportunities of individual companies into the prices that it holds. All that said, I think 
because of what we've seen with this global pandemic, there's a lot more focus being placed on, uh, for example, how companies are treating their employees. We have a lot of employees working from home. Um, I think there's been a lot of focus placed on compensation. And you know, we have frontline workers, essential workers, what are they being paid? What are the white collar executive workers being paid who work from home, maybe aren't put at risk? I think there's a lot of emphasis there. I think there's a lot of emphasis just on the overall um, risk management for companies that if we get into a situation, whether it's a global pandemic or other um, sorts of issues, what does that corporate governance look like? Um, how, how strong is a company? Are they, do they have an ability to, to withstand these outside risks? Just overall, what are the corporate values? And I think if you look at a lot of ESG screens, they incorporate many of these factors. And so I think that coming out of this, you're gonna have a subset of investors who they really believe in these things and they're gonna to wanna to express these views through their investments. I think ESG ETFs are going to be a natural place to look. One other point that I would mention there is, you know, there's been this refrain that if I invest in ESG, am I sacrificing performance? And the way the ESG funds as a whole were positioned coming into this, um, this situation, they were heavier on technology companies and they were lighter on energy companies. Well, lo and behold, energy companies have been bludgeoned and tech companies have performed pretty well. And so I think what, that's gonna, what you're gonna see is sort of a performance tailwind. And anytime you have a performance tailwind, performance looking more attractive, you're gonna naturally have investors look at whatever that space is, in this case, ESG. And so I think that's gonna help ESG as well. We'll see what happens longer term. Uh, I am still skeptical just overall on this space, but I do think here in the short term, those are two pretty uh, substantial tailwinds that ESG will have overall. It's definitely a fascinating um, discussion. And um, and finally, um, I know earlier sort of videos like this in the in the pandemic would talk about working from home tips, etc., stuff like that. But we've all been working from home for quite a while now. Um, so as we move towards the hopefully latter half of the pandemic and things start becoming a little bit normal, can you talk about anything positive that you've gained um, during this pandemic? If that's spending more time with family, balancing your work life um, a little bit more, is there anything that you think you've got from it positively? Well, first of all, if you can't tell, I'm in my basement, so I'm <laughs> absolutely ready to get out of the basement and back into an office environment. But, um, you know, I think for me, this has really helped just provide some perspective on life in general. I think we all tend to get um, really focused on our day-to-day -day drive, you know, work, if you have kids or a family, um, if you, you know, exercise, whatever it is that you focus on on a day-to-day -day basis. I think we all tend to get into that, um, that mode of just focusing on those things. And I think what this has helped do for me personally is just to break up that daily routine, that daily grind, and, and have just a broader perspective on, on what's really important. And I try to do that anyway. I just think this has helped bring it even more to the forefront. And, and certainly there are benefits getting to see my kids more often and you know, maybe even being able to go out for a jog occasionally more often things like that that maybe I wouldn't have done previously because I'm in the office all day. Um, I just think this has helped. It's been a good resetting for me personally to, to just remember what truly is important. Definitely. I think, like you said, having a perspective on things is, is always good. And unfortunately, this has you know, been something, um, you know, quite a bad thing that's given us perspective, but at least it's given us it anyway. Um, Nate, thanks so much for speaking to me today. Enjoy the rest of your day. My pleasure. It was, it was great talking to you.